Perfect. Okay. So pleasure to virtually meet everyone today. Thanks for joining this session. Um, just wanted to quickly introduce myself. As Karen said, I'm a senior solutions architect here at Databricks, uh, where I work with some of our largest customers here in the Bay Area. And really what I wanted to talk about today was a topic that a lot of my customers are asking about me about in the field. Okay. And that the topic at hand is how do we capture change data from a Delta table? Before we get too far into the weeds on that topic, lots to talk about on that today. I wanted to also uh, welcome Denny Lee, who's my colleague at Data Bricks. He's, de he's a developer advocate here at Data Bricks, and he's run about 26 of these uh, online meetups in the last week. So uh, you're gonna hear my voice a little bit more today than his. Uh, he'll be popping up with some color commentary and uh, also moderate moderating the chat as well. So what are we speaking about today? So the topic of the talk is how do we capture change data from a Delta table? And we're first going to begin with motivation behind this. Okay. Why are we even here today? Then we're going to look at three different architectural patterns of how we can actually achieve this using Delta. And in these patterns, we'll look at some slide based architectures, but we'll also have live demos if the demo gods uh, smile on us favorably today. We'll wrap that up with a summary and uh, have lots of time for questions at the end. Please get your questions in throughout the presentation. We may find uh, good points to break and, and answer some of those throughout the presentation as well. Okay. So capturing change data from a Delta table, like why is this an important, an important subject? And I think it's really well summed up by a conversation that I had with my colleague yesterday. I told her that I was gonna do an online Delta tech talk on this subject. And she said, Paul, that's a really confusing topic. She said, you are mixing concepts from two different worlds. And I completely understand what she means. So on one hand, change data capture is a topic that enterprise architects have been speaking about for the past 30 years. And generally, it's in relation to large SQL stores and perhaps in this data warehouse paradigm. And every technology has a way to do it, whether it's scraping bin logs or stored procedures or triggers. And you might be familiar with a, a schema like this that uh, MySQL gives you where you get these CDC underscore tables that give you this, this change data from each of these tables. But Delta Lake operates up in the cloud, right? It's in the cloud data lake paradigm. So are we really talking about change data capture again? And the counter to my colleague was, it's kind of like what I really like about Delta and part of the appeal behind it. Many of the things that we know and love about data warehouses like acid transactions and schema enforcement and fine grained updates and deletes, we are reestablishing in this paradigm of the cloud data lake. And Personally, I think the change data capture will be one that we look to, to capture in, the, in this setting as well. And this is just a really natural cycle of innovation and disruption, right? We were forced to innovate from the data warehouse because uh, data volumes are exploding and data variety was exploding and you know, the data no longer fit into these nice tabular structures. So we arrived at the cloud data lake where we're using object storage, which is super cheap. We're using managed cloud services that allows us to be really agile and you know, we have cloud elasticity, but that's the innovation. The disruption is we lose some of the things that we know and love, right? So the part of the appeal behind Delta for me is reestablishing some of these uh, good practices that we had in previous generations. So let me introduce the topic um, a little more formally here, or at least as formally as a slide with a picture of a dog on it allows me to do. But perhaps you're a data engineer at your organization and you love Delta Lake because you can mix appends and updates and deletes. You can create these huge petabyte scale Delta Lake tables using scale out Spark computations and have multiple consumers of this data all with asset guarantees, right? So you, you love that, you're there. And then you get that call from your business lead and they say, you know that Delta Lake table you created, every time a record is inserted or changes or is deleted from that table, can you send that downstream for me? Because we've got a business process that relies on this. And you're left very much like the dog in the photo here with the rubber gloves on, you're like, now what, okay? 
So that's really what we're here to talk about today. How do we detect those, ch those changes that are happening in our Delta table so we can propagate them downstream? So the first pattern that we're gonna look at is the so-called bronze, silver, gold propagation. And you might have heard this um, if you subscribe to previous tech talks, but I'll give a brief synopsis of what this is. So there's an architecture that's grown up around Delta Lake, which is called the bronze, silver, gold architecture, or perhaps the medallion architecture. And essentially what this is, is different areas of your lake that you separate for different qualities of data. So your bronze, area is a, an area of your lake where you collect the raw data coming in from its source. So perhaps you've got events coming into Kafka and you might write them into a Delta Lake table um, and just keep on appending onto the bottom of that table. And you don't wanna perform any cleaning. You wanna capture data in its purest form so that no mistakes can creep into this data whatsoever. But then you want to actually apply some cleaning to it and perhaps apply a schema and do some filtering and create a silver table, right? And this might be a table that data scientists are consuming. So they get something close to raw, but don't have to do all the boring stuff. Um, and then finally, you might perform some aggregates to this data, produce these business level aggregates that multiple consumers will be really interested in. Right? That's the gold area. And so in each area of this lake, we are propagating data through it, okay? And actually this is a really, a really uh, good place to start talking about change data capture, right? Because if we've got events that are being pumped into our bronze Delta Lake table here, then we want a really efficient way to propagate them into our silver Delta Lake table, okay? Having cleaned them. So specifically, if we insert a thousand records into our bronze table, then we want to be able to, um, you know, just read those thousand records, clean them and, and write them to our silver table. So how do we do this in Delta? So we can actually use an API, which possibly you all are familiar with, we know and love from uh, Spark Stricted Streaming, it's spark.readstream. And that fully supports the Delta format here. And we can just simply point spark.readstream format Delta and point it at our underlying Delta store. So here, this is a customer bronze Delta table that's stored in S3, right? So the first point here, you can, if, it, if this table is append only, you can simply read this as a stream using spark.readstream. And the second point is you should totally use this pattern because it's something that we really encourage and lots of customers do. And I'll, I'll give some of the reason behind that. Um, there was previous methods where you could part, you could point, re, you know, Spark read stream at an S3 directory and use wildcards and it would, uh, you know, basically read it as a stream. However, anyone who's actually tried to do that in production realizes that soon you're, you're performing list book operations on millions and millions of files, which is very costly and just degrades in performance over time. So Delta doesn't have that penalty because uh, if you subscribe to the last Delta Tech Talk, we keep, keep this transaction log that essentially tells uh, Delta exactly which files make up this Delta table. So we don't have to go back to S3 to do the list bucket. We already have that information. It's a super scalable way to read your Delta tables as a stream. So we've read our, our bronze table as a stream. We can perform our cleaning using all of our structured streaming APIs. Which I'll show you in a moment. And then all we need to do now is write that stream as format Delta and write it into our customer silver Delta table. Okay, so we're propagating from bronze to silver here. And the missing piece of the puzzle that we haven't talked about yet is how do we ensure that every time, uh, you know, that thousand records is inserted into bronze, I only read that thousand records versus the full petabyte worth of data that's in that table. And here we borrow a concept from structured streaming called checkpointing, right? It takes care of this. So you'll notice the second line here, we are using this checkpoint location. Again, uh, we're just pointing to a location on S3, which is safe to do so on, on Databricks. And uh, this is gonna take care of all of the semantics to do with uh, managing offsets and just reading the data exactly once, okay? So this, this guarantees exactly once processing. So let's have a look at the first live demo of today's session. 
And we're going to have a look at exactly this pattern of um, that we just described in the slide, which is how can we automatically uh, propagate data from our bronze delta table into our silver uh, delta table after applying some cleaning to it. Okay. So the data that we're going to be looking at today, and we'll share all these notebooks. Uh, there's going to be a companion blog post to this webinar. So all of these will be shared as well. So we're going to begin, and let me just make this uh, writing a bit bigger for you. We're going to begin by just generating some fake data here. Okay. So there's, there's 2 million records that we're going to put into this table. Half of them say Seinfeld Jerry, and uh, half of them say David Larry. Okay. So it looks something like this, this uh, very duplicated data. This is, our delta, uh, this is our delta table here. So we're just going to begin by inserting this data into our bronze table. Okay, so we just simply use our data frame write API to uh, insert this data in append mode into our bronze delta lake table. Okay. Then what we need to do is to define the pipeline which will automatically scan this table and propagate any of the data, the new data to our customer silver table, having cleaned it. So I'm just going to start my my streaming job here while I um, while I talk through it. So this is very similar to the slides that we just saw. So firstly, we're just going to use our helpful read stream API and point it at our delta table. We're then going to perform our actual uh, our cleaning of the data. So here we are just simply sp splitting Seinfeld Jerry into two columns, Jerry and Seinfeld. And then we're going to write that data to our customer silver delta table. And we should be able to see that we've processed some records here. Yep, some, uh, some records are initially processed. And we'll be able to see the results if we run this next cell here. So this is a, uh, this is a visualization of the the customer silver data set. So you can see that we've split that one column of Seinfeld Jerry into two. Okay. So we've propagated data from bronze to silver here. Okay. Let's run some quick diagnostics on this table. So let's have a look at this uh, silver uh, delta table. And we can see that, in fact, yes, we have a million records corresponding to Jerry Seinfeld and a million Larry David records here. Perfect. Okay, but let's really put ourselves to the test. Nothing like a live demo of a test here. So since we have defined this streaming pipeline and it's still running now, that is automatically scanning our bronze table and propagating it to silver, we should be able to insert more records into our bronze table and it be automatically picked up and propagated. So let's do exactly that. Let's generate a million more records that now say Elaine Bennis in them and write it into our customer bronze delta table. And we should be able to see a spike appear in our chart. There we go. So if we look back at our streaming pipeline, we can see that we've processed a bunch of data. The spike is the data that I just inserted. And we should be able to see them automatically propagated both in, uh, well, they should obviously be in the bronze table here. So now we see in bronze, we have uh, three different types of records. And here, here is Elaine Bennis. We should be able to see them in silver as well. Okay, so here's our customer silver data set. And indeed, we can see that we now have Seinfeld, Bennis, and David automatically propagated there. So I'll just do that one more time for demonstration. So uh, we could choose our favorite uh, uh, Seinfeld character, uh, here, Cosmo Kramer, perhaps. Um, and, uh, and we could just insert those records here. We should be able to see a spike in our chart here. Okay, corresponding to the records that have been processed. And then they will be automatically propagated into our uh, silver delta lake table here. Fantastic. So now we have four different records here. We have Cosmo, we have Seinfeld, Bennis, and David. So it's really cool, right? Because we could just be pumping in records into our bronze table via Kafka. And we've got this automated pipeline that's just sucking records out of there, cleaning them and pushing them into silver. And then people could be consuming that data straight away, right? So it's a really awesome way of quickly cleaning your records so that people can start consuming that data. 
So this is our this is our first pattern um, of, of reading change data from a from a delta table. Um, I wanted to mention one edit that you can make to this pipeline uh, that many of our customers choose to do. So in the example that we just saw, uh, the data was really duplicated, and you might be saying, "Paul, that's not a clean data set, right? Like, I don't want my users consuming that data." Um, so what you might want to do is add a deduplication step there as well. So what you can actually do, and there'll be links to this in the blog post, is when you actually read from bronze to silver, you can perform some deduplication against the, against the sink so that you don't get all of those, uh, those duplicates entering your, your silver table. So that's pattern one. Um, and I just wanted to check with Denny, any, any thoughts or comments or any questions coming through the line there? Oh, no problem. Uh, we answered a bunch of the questions right away, uh, basically on the Q&A panel, considering uh, like, you know, the street stream only works with the Delta format right away. One thing I did want to clarify right away is that, um, which you alluded to, but I'll just, well, I wanted to call it out specifically, was that, uh, yeah, if you were to try to do this where you were running this on Parquet instead, what you'll end up happening is that you'll have one Parquet stream right and the second Parquet stream will actually just fail to process because when you're using Parquet, you don't have that those asset transactions to protect the data. So hence the importance of why to do this process, to do this pattern that Paul's describing here, you really need to go ahead and utilize Delta. Even though it's using Parquet under the covers, that transaction log really does a lot. So yeah, I think that was the only clarifying statement here. Fantastic. All right, so let's move on to pattern number two then. So we know that you don't just use Delta because you want to do append-only pipelines, right? You love the fact that you can do updates against your Delta tables, right? So what about if our table's being updated? So let's introduce this concept. So now let's assume that we have a, um, we have a, a source of updates, which is perhaps coming from Kafka, right? And now we're streaming inserts and updates into a Delta table. And we want to be able to capture any time we have a change and propagate it downstream somewhere. So for example, we might insert a record. We definitely want to capture that, but we've already discussed that. We might update a record that was inserted 30 days ago. And we definitely want to be able to capture that and push it downstream. So this is kind of a classic change data capture use case. We're not considering deletes yet, just uh, FYI. So I actually came across a really interesting example of this in a field, which I think will illuminate this use case. So I was working with an e-commerce website uh, com company here in the Bay Area, and they were using Delta to store a big feature store for their customers. So you can imagine each one of the records in this feature store was a different customer. And all of the attributes or columns in this Delta table were the different features associated with that customer. And every time one of the features changes, they want to automatically detect that and pass it to a model to score that customer so they can make better recommendations to them on their website. So that's a really natural change data capture use case because we need to be scanning this feature store table and finding any time anything's changed, right? So how would we do that in Delta? So we can still, uh, still do that using our favorite read stream API. However, this time we need to use what's called the ignore changes flag, okay? And I will explain exactly what that means. So using the ignore changes flag will emit any file rewrite operation to the stream. And that might sound cryptic, so I have a diagram for you here. So let's imagine that we have our feature store delta table right here and we run this arbitrary update command against my Delta table, or you could be using the merge, in, merge syntax as well. And this update command is gonna change the name to four X's where customer ID is 101. So what Delta will do under the hood is use all its data skipping under the hood to really efficiently find the file where customer 101 lives, right? Then it will perform the rewrite logic to swap out the name and it will rewrite this file. And it will rewrite it as a different file, file number 10, and uh, write that into the transaction log and sunset the old file in the transaction log as well. And what ignore changes will do is we will get the whole file emitted to us when we call a read stream on this Delta table. 
So if I just go back to my previous slide here, this might make a little bit more sense now. The, the changes that we get in our stream will be a file level CDC. So they're guaranteed to, uh, to include all the data that's changed, but it might be a superset of that, meaning there might be extra records that weren't the one customer we've changed. In our case, I'm completely fine with this trade-off. It's a really easy way to get changed data out of Delta. And um, in this case, you know, we just want to rescore customers who have a changed feature and make sure they get a new recommendation. But if we're rescoring some other customers as well, I'm not too concerned about that because their recommendation won't change. Okay, so this is a really easy way to do it if you understand the trade-offs. So again, let's have a look at a live demo of this scenario. So the scenario that we're gonna try and replicate here is we're gonna build our feature store Delta table. We're gonna throw some updates at it and see whether we can automatically propagate them downstream having scored them. Okay, so let's have a look at this architecture here. So we're gonna use our favorite characters from Seinfeld here, um, or at least two of them, si uh, Jerry Seinfeld and Larry David right here. So this time the, um, the data frame or the Delta table is gonna look like this, right? It says it's got a few extra columns here, last purchase day and a customer ID. And we're gonna begin by, again, writing this into our feature store Delta table uh, using our uh, data frame write API. And we're just writing it into S3 here um, as our feature store Delta table. We're then gonna define a model to actually uh, score these customers. And I'm not gonna go too much into this model. All you need to know, it's a UDF, which means that essentially you give it a customer record and it'll produce a numerical score for you. And now what we need to do is to define this pipeline that's able to automatically detect these changes and score them and write them to our customer score delta table. So let me uh, start this, uh, this streaming job while, uh, while I talk through this. So again, we've, we've seen a lot of this in the slideware already, but we're gonna call our read stream API with the ignore changes flag and point it at our feature store. We're then going to uh, uh, apply our model UDF, which is the model that's gonna score the customer. And we're gonna create a new column with that. And then we're simply just gonna write this as Delta format again to our customer's scored table, okay? So we should be able to see, yep, some records have been processed through our streaming pipeline already. So let's have a look at the output here. So here is the customer scored uh, data, uh, Delta table. And we can see that it looks very similar to what we saw before. We've got two extra columns, which is the score of the customer and the score timestamp, okay. And in this live demo session, we like to, again, put ourselves to the test here. So let's throw an update at this feature store table and see whether it gets automatically propagated into our customer score Delta table. Okay, so I'm going to run this uh, command right here. And those of you familiar with Delta APIs, this is the Scholar API that allows you to um, update a record or a series of records in a Delta table. So what I'm saying here is, find customer zero and update the last purchase date, right, in our feature store Delta table here. And when I do that, I should be able to see, if we scroll back up to our chart here, look, yeah, so we already have a spike in our stream, which means some data was propagated into our pipeline, right? So our, we have detected this change and we should be able to uh, see our, customer has been rescored in our customer score data set. So we can see that now we have Jerry Seinfeld in here twice, customer ID zero, and one of them was, uh, you know, this minute, right? So in fact, we have been able to detect the changes in our Delta table, score it and automatically propagate it downstream. The one caveat that, uh, you know, we've already discussed, but I just wanted to make sure that you're very clear on this point. So, uh, let's read this customer score data set again. And um, if you see what actually happened here, uh, there are 31,000 records that were rescored as part of the last update. 
okay? So uh, we made one change and that triggered 31 rescorings, took a fraction of the second, so it didn't really matter. Um, so, you know, there was 2 million records in the Delta table in total. We rescored 31,000 uh, because of this, this update to the, to the Delta table. Fantastic. So this is, uh, this is what I would call a, a really good pattern for really easily reading change data. Um, from a delta table when you've got updates uh, being applied to that, that delta table. And I just wanted to take a break and a check there, Denny, any questions that I can answer or any uh, comments I should be aware of in the, in, in the chat there? Cool. Uh, actually, the, the quick call out here uh, right now actually had a little less to do with the pattern that you designed, because I think a lot of the, the a lot of people are completely grokking the questions around that, but more about the internals. And so mm. to help clarify some of these things, uh, just because it, it would take a long time, <laughs> right, to, to basically clarify all, all of those things. Uh, what I did is I went ahead and put um, three YouTube links inside the chat for everybody. Uh, that uh, on unpacking the transaction log, if you want to know more about how the Delta Lake transaction log works. Uh, also about schema evolution enforcement, that by default, Delta Lake enforces the schema. And then just as Paul has been talking about, you, if you want to evolve the schema, you can. And then how that works. And uh, we've uh, put a link inside there as well. And finally, also about, uh, we're talking about updates and a precursor to delete, <laughs> um, how the internals of that work in Delta Lake as well. And we've included that link as well inside uh, the chat. Now, for those who of you are using on YouTube Live as opposed to uh, on uh, Zoom, not a big deal. We're going to be placing these links also in the description of the YouTube when uh, the session is finished. And so that was what, that was the key call out uh, for at least for these set of questions. Perfect. Thank you very much, Danny. Of course. All right. So let's crack on with the third and final pattern here. And probably the title now makes sense. Can we do better? So last time we saw how we can um, produce file level change streams by using the ignore changes flag. But can we actually get record level change streams and can we deal with deletes? So that's pattern number three. And the first part of pattern number three is you might call this a you know, a, a cheat pattern for the, for the really simple use cases. Okay, so uh, let me describe this. So let's say we have a source of updates, inserts, and deletes. Perhaps get this is coming from Kafka again. The first of the way that we can achieve this record level chain, chain stream from a delta table is to first write this into a bronze table as a pen. So even if a record is saying, you know, update a particular record, we're going to write that as an append into our, del into our bronze layer. We'll then subscribe to that table as a stream, like in pattern one, and we will apply those updates and deletes and inserts, how they're meant to be applied, right? So we'll apply them as, as those things and produce our silver table. And the silver table will be the one that people are consuming. Now, the question we have here is, how do we detect the changes that are happening in our silver table? Well, in fact, because we have a very simple setup here, right? We've made the assumption that we've just got one source of, of updates and, and deletes and inserts. We don't actually have to detect the changes, right? There's only one pipe coming into our silver table. So we can simply redirect that pipe elsewhere as well. So uh, we can send that data. We can do a second read stream on this bronze table and they're completely independent of each other using different checkpoint directories. And we can send that downstream. So the first way of reading record level change data from a Delta table is to kind of avoid it altogether, which you know, is the kind of best way to, to solve anything. <laughs> so this will work in really simple use cases where we have uh, one source of, uh, of updates and deletes and inserts, and we have very simple uh, update logic happening in our delta layer, right? If there's very complicated logic when we apply our updates, then we perhaps don't want to have to replicate that downstream, right? But if it's very simple, then uh, that's less of a risk. But how do we do this in a more general pattern when we don't have just this one input source of, of updates and deletes? And we can actually borrow a trick from the data warehousing world. 
and we can introduce a change log table. Many of you might, might be familiar with this. So what this allows us to do, let me speak through the architecture diagram here. So we have our source of updates, inserts and deletes come streaming in. And we're gonna perform a um, transactional write to two different delta tables here. So firstly, we're gonna apply the updates, updates, inserts and deletes to our main delta table, the table that people will be consuming for and using for analytics. But then we'll also perform a second write into our change log table and we'll write everything as, as an append, right? So you can imagine over time, this change log is gonna, it's very self-descriptive. It's gonna be a record of all the changes that have been happening in our main delta table. And because we're writing them as appends, we can actually read this as a stream, like we've been talking about and perform a join against the main delta table to retrieve, to retrieve the full record. So let's have a look at how we do that. So how can we begin by uh, reading our streaming source and writing it to two different delta tables in this manner? So the magic we use here, for those of you familiar with the structured streaming world, is we use this concept of a for each batch. Okay, so uh, Spark structured streaming uh, operates in this micro batch, batch format. And we can use this for each batch function or API to um, implement a custom function with what we want to do with that batch. Okay, so this upsert to delta capture CVC function is the thing that's going to tell delta or structured streaming rather to write to two tables. I'll share the full code of how you actually implement that function in, in the blog post, but I wanted to really uh, call this out diagrammatically because I think the, the pictorial is, is a little more uh, appropriate for, for 9 a.m. On a, on a Thursday. So let's begin with the following, uh, the following diagram. So here's our main delta table that has three columns, ID, some string, and some other string. Okay? And this is the table that all of our users are consuming. Then we have this source of updates that's coming in. And essentially it's just gonna, it's gonna change one of the columns in our main Delta table uh, to oranges. So you can imagine if we apply this to this table, we're gonna have apples and oranges sprinkled through our main Delta table. And these are all type updates here. So what we're gonna do in our for each batch function is the first thing we're gonna do is actually just drain our records out of our streaming source. And we're gonna apply them as updates to our main Delta table. So here we have apples and oranges sprinkled through our, our table. But then we're also gonna write them as inserts into our change log and record the batch they happened in. So we can see that we are recording what is happening in our main Delta table in a separate table called change log. And then all we need to do is read this change log as a stream and join it with our main Delta table to assemble the full records and pass it to our downstream CDC consumer. So now we have these two records, the, the zero record and the, the second record here. And uh, these are the exactly the, the changes that happened in our Delta table. So this is how we can perform this record level um, CDC stream. I just wanted to talk a little bit about how you perform this bit here before we go into the live demo. So uh, we're talking about the, the second part of this, this structure here how, when we perform the join. So we're simply going to do that by again using our read stream API, pointing at our change log here. And then uh, we're going to join it onto our main table, which is our delta table that contains all of the data um, to assemble the full record here using the ID, which is our unique identifier here. And there's a really uh, awesome property of Delta that we're using here, which is so nuanced, but so useful, <laughs> which is when we perform this kind of stream to static join, the static side will actually automatically refresh with changing data under the hood. So this main table is actually changing under the hood, right? We're, playing up to, we're applying updates to it. And uh, we don't need to do anything every time this, uh, this executes in each batch of the structured streaming, it will read the latest data, right? Which doesn't happen in Parquet. And it's a really, really nice feature of Delta, which uh, you get for completely free. So let's have a look at a demo of this uh, architecture. 
So here's what we're going to try and do. So this is the architecture that we had on the slide before. We have a, a source of updates. Here it's being captured in a delta table. This could be Kafka or Kinesis or Event Hubs or anything. We're going to read from here and we're going to automatically apply our updates to our main delta table and simultaneously write to our change log. Then we're going to read our change log as a stream and join it back to our main delta table and send it downstream somewhere. So let's begin by making some fake data and writing it into our del delta table. Okay. So our main delta table is going to look like this. Okay, so it's as you saw in the slides. Uh, we have three columns here, and everything says apples and cakes. It's all a happy world. Here's our update table that we're going to use to update that one. So it on every second ID, it says oranges. So you can imagine if we apply this to our uh, main delta table, it's going to be apples and oranges sprinkled um, amongst the data set. Okay. Now what we're going to do is define this part of the streaming pipeline that performs this simultaneous write. So here is my, um, my alluded to um, function that will perform, which will be operated on as part of the for each batch. You can check this out when we provide the links. Um, but what I wanted to do was just to start my streaming pipeline here. So again, what we're doing here is just reading our update table, the source of our updates as a stream. And then we are uh, calling our for each batch with our custom function here to write to this main delta table and our change log. And our stream is uh, just initializing right now. It should be processing its data, um, finishing up any second now. So here we go. So we can see that our data has actually been processed through this part of the pipeline. And we should be able to see to start with that our main delta table is being uh, updated. Okay, so we should be able to see apples and oranges sprinkled through this data set. There we go. So every even ID has been changed to oranges. So we have indeed applied the updates to this to this delta table. And the second thing we need to check is, are we actually logging the changes to our change log table? So let's have let's query our, our change log table here. Okay, cool. So you can see every second ID is being logged to the change log and it's recording that there was a change to this record in batch ID zero. Okay. Now what we need to do is assemble the second part of the pipeline, which is read the change log as a stream and join it to our main delta table. So let me start that part of the processing while I talk you through the code here. So uh, we are reading as a stream here. We're reading this change log as a stream. We are simply joining it onto our main delta table. This is a stream to static join. And then we are writing it out to our destination table, a CDC consumer, if you like, the change stream before records. Okay. And we've already sucked some data into this pipeline and processed it. So we should be able to query this table, the change stream full records, and see what the CDC consumer will be getting. So indeed, we are uh, sending every second ID to the downstream consumer, and we're sending the full record that was changed in the Delta table. So we have actually managed to perform some record level CDC here. So again, the structure of these demos, let's put ourselves to the test again, and we should be able to write more data into our update table here, and it, for, for it to be propagated through the pipeline. So let's just throw some data in there. And the data that we're going to throw in there is um, every third ID, we're going to change to pairs now, right? So let's have a look at that uh, update set here. So every third ID, we want to change some string to, to pairs, OK? So we've written that into our update table. Since my streaming pipelines are running, it should be getting propagated through my pipeline here. So let's just have a, a quick look up at my um, pipeline. So here's my streaming pipeline. And we see that we have a, a spike in my stream. That means I've read some data and some data was processed. So that's the first part of the pipeline. So that looks good. And then the second part of the pipeline, I have a second spike, which means the data has been propagated through there. So if I go down here, 
we should be able to see that some more data has arrived in our downstream location. And here we see it. So we see that uh, we have data corresponding to batch ID one and some string has now been cha changed to pairs. Okay, so this is what we can send downstream. So we were actually able to implement a pipeline which uh, captures changes that are happening in our main delta table and sends them downstream. And we're doing that at a, a, at a record level, which is fantastic. So the last comment I'll make on this is uh, we haven't talked about deletes, right? But this can really easily be extended to capture deletes as well. So let's say that one of our records in our streaming source was a delete. It says delete record 10. So in this pattern, what we would do is go, and, uh, go ahead and apply that delete to our delta table. But we would then also log that in our change log that a delete happened. And then we would just modify our join a little bit to do a left join here, if this is left side of the join, and we can send this downstream. So actually this change log pattern is really flexible and allows us to capture all types of changes that are happening in our Delta table, uh, which is one reason that I really like this pattern. And Denny, I'll just stop there and see if there's any uh, questions or comments on that, that third pattern. No, actually, the uh, right now, a lot of the questions are sort of uh, revolving around how to do the orchestration around this. Mm. And so, for example, um, th this is a really cool pattern. They're seeing that you can do the updates and deletes. So I, I just did want to do two little call outs. One is that um, uh, in terms of orchestration, it really is up to you on terms of your particular environment. So if you're using, for example, if you're running it locally, you could always do like a cron job, for example, like good old fashioned cron jobs or, or Jenkins. Um, if you are going ahead and doing things in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, you have a more scheduler type of design than perhaps a system like Apache Airflow. Uh, or to, to basically do the orchestration, or if you're in Azure, Azure Data Factory. Um, uh, the other one, uh, call out that I usually do is that, of course, if you're using Databricks, you would use Databricks jobs, right? basically to align or flow the, uh, the way to run this. Uh, the other question basically is that should you, uh, what's the best way to do this as a nightly batch rather than a stream? And so the quick call out that I would say is that, you absolutely can run this as a batch if you wanted to, the, uh, in terms of like just processing as a change set. And in fact, what's great about Paul's example here is that you just cr change read stream to read, right? So in other words, to, to go from batch to stream, what's great about Spark in general, and then with Delta Lake underneath the covers is that you just switch from read stream to read in order to go from batch to, uh, sorry, from streaming to batch. Saying this, um, a, a really, common reason or popular reason on why you want to keep this as a stream anyways is because of the fact that if you need to orchestrate many many different batch jobs instead of actually having one like instead of having 50 or 70 different batch jobs you could potentially just run this as a stream instead so in other words basically a bunch of mini batch jobs and so for example customers like comcast which you'll uh which uh, talked about how they did this back in spark summit uh san francisco 2019 in the keynote they went from 84 different jobs down to three and because they were able to, using Delta Lake underneath the covers, they were able to reduce their batch jobs from 84 batch jobs down to three streaming jobs. And so it was operationally much simpler to be able to maintain and operate this type of design. And so, so when you're looking or thinking about streaming, it's not just about going in specifically the context of streaming per se. It, it is also about managing or simplifying the management of many batch jobs as well. And so that's an important call out that I figured that should be called out here that as in why when you're looking at a session like this one in terms of CDC, even if you initially want to start as a batch and again, just switch from <laughs> read stream to read, right? You may want to seriously consider uh, the context of staying as a stream job anyways, just because of the potential operational benefits as well. Great point. And uh, just one thing I'd add to that, another really common pattern here is using uh, a trigger once philosophy that basically turns a read stream into a batch um, execution and allows you to kind of then go backwards. So trigger once will essentially 
um, every time it goes to the streaming source, it will just read all the records that are in there and process them in batch, right? Um, so this is a really common pattern as well. Fantastic. So coming up on the last 10 minutes, here, so I just want to wrap this up in a summary. What have we seen today? So we've looked at three different patterns of reading change data from a delta table. Uh, the first one of these is what I called an append-only pipeline, really commonly used in this bronze, silver, gold propagation across your lake. The second was what I like to call the easy button for the update pipelines using the ignore changes flag. And remember what happens here, we get this file level CDC stream, but it's really, really easy to implement. And then the third pattern here is this change log paradigm, borrowing a concept from data warehousing. And this actually allows us to capture this record level change stream uh, like you would perhaps get in, in a data warehouse. So I'd love to hear your feedback on the session. Um, as I've said throughout, there's gonna be a companion blog post with links to all of the, the notebooks and code here. Um, and all the, all the data which is uh, generated in those notebooks as well. Uh, so you'll be able to check this out on your own. So really appreciate you spending the time with us this morning. And Denny, if there's any more questions, uh, happy to take it or uh, we can go from there. Absolutely. So uh, we've got about five minutes left because I'd like to always finish our webinars a little early. So that way people can prep for the next set of meetings since all of our meetings are online these days. But uh, we should be able to answer most of them. So uh, I'll answer the first one. OK, um, the first question is if we have any query uh, questions uh, about um, in terms of from the webinar per se uh, from this from this webinar uh, and uh, how can we follow up with you after the fact? And so that's why we've been talking about the YouTube, our YouTube channel. So youtube.com slash Databricks. This video actually is propped there. And so we actually do go out of our way to answer questions uh, also on uh, uh, the YouTube channel itself. So pop right into the comments and we'll do our best to answer questions. It usually takes us about 48 hours to answer them because we have a lot of questions with a lot of videos these days. So we don't wanna be able to promise you immediate answers, but we do review them on a pretty regular basis, okay? And so hopefully that will help you jumpstart this process, okay? Um, all right, the next question uh, is basically, it, oh, here, here's a good one. Uh, and Paul, you can answer it or I can answer. Uh, if orchestration steps are dependent on each other, in other words, step A has to be complete before step B will have to start. Uh, uh, basically, it's like you have these dependencies on your jobs between like your gold table versus your silver table. What do you think is the best approach? And I, I realize there are multiple answers, but you know, so why don't we just start that discussion right now? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, really common question we get. Um, and if you want sort of a, a system to be able to run arbitrarily complex DAGs, right, of dependencies, which is what you're describing there, um, we really recommend the integrations that uh, Spark and, and Databricks has with uh, technologies like Apache Airflow or um, Azure Data Factory. Those are really good options for, for that, which provide that kind of arbitrarily complex DAG uh, manipulation and, and uh, execution. Exactly. Yeah, I was just about to add. So that hence the reason for me also calling out Apache Airflow. Uh, that's a very common one uh, for folks to use in the open source land. But the, the the context is that it's as simple or as complicated as you want it to be when it comes to tracking those dependencies. Because for example, you could always just create a shell script that places in like basically uh, case statements <laughs> in your cron job. Uh, it could always start with that, right? And it could go into, for example, when you come to talk about Databricks notebooks, you could potentially just go ahead and, and actually build workflows within your notebooks that have that stack. So, but then exactly as Paul called out, right? And whether it's an Azure Data Factory style or if it's a uh, Apache Airflow or whatever else, the point is that those DAGs can get more and more complicated. And the, usually when we involve those latter ones, it's not just because of the dependencies between silver and gold, but because the dependencies with other systems that you're orchestrating way beyond like in terms of your own system. So partners like Informatica or partners like um, stream sets, which also talk to Delta Lake, they also typically will get involved as well. So again, there's a lot of really good ways to do it. I don't think there's any wrong way per se. It's just more a matter of understanding what is the level of complexity you actually need and then basically designing therefore, uh, designing for that. Because in the end, when it comes to this type of orchestration, 
if you were able to do it with Spark, you're able to do it with Delta Lake because Delta Lake is an underlying storage layer. So whatever you were trying to do with uh, before with Spark, it's pretty much applicable here as well. Okay. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, and then there is, uh, we got some quick calls out to say they really appreciate the session, Paul. I think they love you. Uh, so you could, could, good. Yeah, I, I, I can now quit now. No, I'm joking. Uh, but yes, the PowerPoints and the code will be available. So two quick call outs. Uh, we actually put all the code and uh, the, the notebooks and the PowerPoints directly um, in the Databricks Tech Talks GitHub, which is also linked in the YouTube channel. Okay. And so we put them all there. And then just as Paul alluded to multiple times, we are actually currently writing a blog that provides a lot more of the details that we actually want to go for much deeper than just what we're able to do in a, you know, 50, 55 minute tech talk. So uh, we will be following with that with additional information link to this video, but also link to the Tech Talks uh, GitHub repo and link uh, which contains the code and the notebooks, okay? All right, cool. I, I think the final question I wanna uh, tackle here is basically uh, before we hand it back to Karen, is that if you uh, run, uh, you're loading to the trigger once, Paul. And so mm -hmm. basically if you change the read stream to a read, this is about going back to like uh, from stream to batch, can you still use the checkpoints or do you use the, have to track the watermarks yourself? And yeah. great question, so. Yeah, yeah. So that's, uh, if you use the, just the read method, then you don't, you don't get to use the checkpoints. So you exactly. have to track the watermarks yourself. That's the real benefit of using the trigger once is that you uh, you can execute in like a batch mode, but still take advantage of all of those nice things in structured streaming, like the checkpointing. And the other thing to say is that it allows you to evolve in the future. So if you want to move from batch to streaming with a five minute or 30 second trigger interval, then it's a really easy change to do. Excellent. And that's exactly, by the way, just to uh, add to Paul's point, that's precisely what, what I meant by the or uh, simplifying your orchestration of batch jobs uh, to streaming, because the idea is that you have things like checkpoints and watermarks that are included in streaming that are not included in batch that you basically can take advantage of for the purpose of orchestration. Okay. And cool. With that, I did want to finish it up. Uh, thank you very much for the great questions. Thank you, Paul, for an amazingly awesome session. And Karen, uh, back to you to wrap it up. I appreciate your time. Thanks, Denny. Thanks, Paul. It was a great presentation. And thanks, everyone, for uh, participating and asking all of your questions and comments. Um, really helps make the presentation.